1948. For Palestinians, that year is a Nakba, or the catastrophe. When hundreds of thousands were forced out of their homes, For Israelis, that year marks the creation of the State of Israel. As a filmmaker and as a Palestinian, this documentary series was my way to understand the events of the past that are still shaping the present. On April the 19th, 1936, the Palestinians launched a national strike to protest against mass Jewish immigration and what they saw as Britain's alliance with the Zionist movement. The British responded with force. During the six months of the strike, over 190 Palestinians were killed and more than 800 wounded. Wary of popular revolt, Arab leaders advised the Palestinians to end the strike. When the statement was released, the Prime Minister Amir Abdullah Mouqa'ali and the King of Yemen, the Imam, and the people of Palestine, that they would be able to get rid of it. Palestinian leaders bowed to pressure from the Arab heads of state and agreed to meet the British Royal Commission of Inquiry, headed by Lord Peel. In its report of July 1937, the Peel Commission recommended the partition of Palestine. The report drew the frontiers of a Jewish state in one third of Palestine and an Arab state in the remaining two-thirds to be merged with Transjordan. A corridor of land from Jerusalem to Jaffa would remain under British mandate. The Commission also recommended transferring, were necessary, Palestinians from the lands allocated to the new Jewish state. The Commission's proposals were widely published and provoked heated debate. يصر السحيونيين من تقرير في الكميشن كل السرور لأنه مضمون في التقرير فكرة ترانسفير عي انتقال الشعوب من منطقة أخرى خلال عقيدتهم أو قوميتهم فبالنسبة إلا السحيونيين معنى ترانسفير يعني قد يوصلوا على دولة تنظيف وتطهير فلسطين من سكانها العرب من وجهه النظر الصهيونيه عمليه تم التخطيط لها عشرات السنين قبل وجود لجنة تسمى بلجنة الترانسفير التي كان يرأسها يوسف فايتس 
فايس الذي كان يشكل الساعد الايمن لبن غوريون وهذا في سنوات الثلاثين طبعا هذا يؤكد انه المخطط الصهيوني كان يدرس مسبقا ضروره التخطيط المنهجي ل تطهير هذه البلاد من العرب خدمة للفكر الصهيوني لكي يتسنى ترويج فكرة أرض بدون سكان لسكان بدون أرض. From the 1930s, especially from the late 1930s onwards, they did uh, uh, start to discuss it very intensively, but still secretly. So I think it wasn't uh, possible for many Palestinians to know what we know today as historians because it was in the archives. كان في جهاز تصنّت. يعني اليهود في الثلاثينات هذا شيء انا استغربت جدا يعني المكالمات حجم من الحسين من من مكتبه كان في تصنت اليهود وكانوا يسجلوا كل اللي بيحكي وهي كانوا يعرفوا كمان اذا في يهود بيحكوا مع جماعه حجم امين وكانوا يحكوا يروحوا عندهم ويحكوا لهم انتم بتغلطوا حتى ما حكوا اشياء اسرار يعني ما كشفوا اسرار as the palestinian revolt continued britain's response hardened between 1936 and 1937, the British killed over 1,000 Palestinians. 37 British military police and 69 Jews also died. In September 1937, Britain declared martial law and disbanded the main Palestinian political organ, the Arab Higher Committee, headed by the Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al Husseini. Five of its members were exiled to the Seychelles Islands in the Indian Ocean, a remote British colony. One of these was the mayor of Jerusalem, Hussein al-Khalidi. Outcast in the Seychelles, he wrote a diary condemning British policy and its support for Zionism. In October 1937, fearing imprisonment, Haj Amin al-Husseini and other Palestinian leaders fled to Lebanon. The political leadership of the Palestinians was now in exile. A school textbook from this period shows what Palestinian schoolchildren were learning. The book defines Palestine as bordering Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, Transjordan, and the Mediterranean Sea. Within 10 years, all this was to change. The revolt continued despite the absence of the Palestinian leadership. To crush the protests, Britain sent in reinforcements. بريطانيا جندت من أجل أن تكسر هذه الثورة أف يعني كانت جندت يعني أشهر جنرالات الجنرال ويفل الجنرال ديل الجنرال ماكبلان الجنرال ريش أربع جنرالات ومشتركوا في الحرب العالمية الأولى. British troops spared no effort in seeking to disarm the Palestinians. This included widespread searches for weapons. إذا وصلوا لقوا رصاصة فاضي في باب بيتنا ينسفوا البيت. كانت بريطانيا تمنع أي واحد يحمل سلاح حتى لو فشك يحاكموا عليها ممنوع يعني في البلد تلتزم أربع فنادق فيش. يجوا عنا تفتيش يفتشوا 
يحط يقب الطحين على الكمح الكمح على الزنق مع العدس خربط الدار ويطلع يطلعوا نحن عند المدرسة يصيروا يصيروا يحكوا كلام عاطل من ذاك الليز آه البلد وروحوا ونرجعوا على الدار بهدلونا الله يبهدلهم نقول لو على الإنجليز كيف كانوا يجوا ياخذوا النسوان ويحطوهم تاخذ لي امي على الجامع ياخذوهم يحطوهم في الجامع ويفوتوا يفتشوا البيوت على الرجال يدوروا على الرجال ويقولوا غيمت غيمت بس يجي الانجليز بالدبابات وبالكذب وبالطيارات يهربوا رجال لانه بدهم يدوروا على على رجال الثوره بدي احكي لك الحكايه اجى العيد لبسنا اواعينا وطلعنا من نروح على الجامع نصلي ما حسينا للطيارات الطوب الا الجيش دخل لما اخذونا قعدونا فتحوا في كراجات محلات وقالوا كمون بهالسنجات وفلينا عبونا في المحلات كلياتها سكروا علينا فش لا شرب ولا شيء ولا شيء صرنا نبول مول على حالنا الرد فعل من نسبة بالنسبه للسلطه البريطانيه كان عنيف جدا كونوا في انذاك كونسنتريشن كامب في فلسطين واخذوا الاف من المواطنين الفلسطينيين وحطوهم بحدول المخيمات للكونسنتريشن كامبس وفي نفس الوقت اعتقالات نعم اعتقالات Among those arrested by the British was Savaj Nassar wife of the newspaper editor Najib Nassar. Arrested without charge, she spent 11 months in prison before being released. As the death toll rose during the revolt, the Palestinian press captured the mood of its community. This cartoon provides an example. It depicts the leaders of the Zionist movement building their state on a foundation of human skulls. While the British authorities disarmed the Palestinians, they armed and equipped special Jewish forces to ostensibly act as a protective militia for Jewish settlements. The Palestinians saw this as further evidence of British bias and injustice. In 1938, an underground Zionist paramilitary organization called Ergen began to increase the number of attacks against Arab targets. In July of that year, the group carried out a succession of bombings in civilian areas in Haifa and Jerusalem. 68 Palestinians were killed. In some cases, British officers were actively engaged in training Jewish paramilitaries. A Jewish paramilitary force called Haganah was trained by Ord Wingate, a British officer and ardent supporter of Zionism. Ord Wingate was very racist towards the Arabs during his role as a British army officer in the Arab revolt that he decided to uh, append to his units Jewish soldiers and he taught them how to occupy Palestinian villages, expel them, destroy them and I think in many ways he contributed directly to the ideas of ethnic cleansing that would be perpetrated on the ground in 1948. British volunteers plus three officers. In 1976, BBC ran a TV series about Wingate's life, containing a scene on his activities in Palestine. Using a combined force of British and Jewish personnel. British soldiers and Haganah men will assemble at 1900 hours, 15th of May, 1938.
Moshe Dayan, later Israel's defense minister, looked up to Ord Wingate as a mentor. Wingate organized special night raids of armed Haganah and British volunteers against Palestinian villages suspected of harboring revolutionaries. وصلت الثورة الفلسطينية إلى قمتها في سن في صيف 1938 وكانت هناك قيادات ميدانية كبيرة جدا. هناك تقريبا 65 قائد محلي و 14 قائد منطقة فتقريبا من 60 إلى 70% من هؤلاء القادة كانوا من القساميين. مثلا في الجليل الأعلى كان هناك القائد خليل القائد القسامي. الذي اشترك في معركة يعبد مع الشيخ القسام خليل العيسى أو إبراهيم الكبير منطقة جلالة عمل منطقة المنطقة الثانية كانت منطقة الجليل الأدنى أو الجليل الأسفل وكان أيضا فيها بقود هذه المنطقة قائد قسام لذلك أنا قلت لك الثورة كانت تبدأ ثورة القسام أبو إبراهيم الصغير اللي هو توفيق لإبراهيم. The Palestinian resistance leader in the Jenin area was Fahan Al Saadi. The Nablus region was commanded by Mohammed Salah Al Hamad. Who was killed in May 1938? Abdel Fattah Mustafa took over command. In Jerusalem, the Palestinian commander was Abdel Qadr al Husseini. In Jaffa, Hassan Salama. By 1938, the Palestinians were beginning to form into more coordinated groups in their uprising against British occupation and Jewish immigration. The commander-in-chief of the revolutionaries was Abdul Rahim Al-Haj Muhammad. لاحق الإنجليز الوالد ووضعوا جوائز لمن يلقى القبض عليه أو يأتي به. والحمد لله تمكن من التخفي والهرب وبدأوا يشكلوا فصائل فلسطيني للجيش. واستمرت هذه الفصائل تعتمد على نفسها وتعتمد على القرى وأذكر عندما جاء الإنجليز جاءوا ونسفوا بيتنا كنا نيام فيقضونا وأخرجونا من البيت ونسفوا البيت على ما فيه الوالد بعث رسالة إلى الحج أمين في تاريخ 18-3-1939 ويشير إلى الحج أمين بأنه بعض الثوار جاءوا إلى دمشق ويصرف عليهم على الملابس وعلى أشياء لا تهم الثورة كثيرا ويجب أن توجه فلوس الثورة إلى الرصاص والبنادق in the last line of his letter, Abdul Rahim Al Haj Muhammad warned that if the Palestinian political leadership did not toughen its stance, then the revolution would be defeated. A few days later, Abdul Rahim was killed in an ambush set up by the British in the village of Sanur. Abdul Rahim left behind him four sons. <laughs> وسقوطه في صنور في أذار 1939 هذا الملف ما زال بولكا في الأرشيفات البريطانية وفي الأرشيفات الإسرائيلية والجود بالنفس أقصى غاية الجود الشباب المجاهدين اللي ناضلوا واستشهدوا هذولا قمة الأمة هو خير هم خير أحسن خير العناصر في الأمة على الإطلاق لا أحد يدنو إلى أقدامه لكن لم يجدوا القيادات التي ترعاهم تنظيم التخطيط فقدنا من الأصل القيادات كانت دون مستوى وعي المرحلة Between 1938 and 1939 the British held dozens of military tribunals 112 Palestinians were executed Among them Fahan al-Sadi the 80-year-old revolutionary from Jenin, executed during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. The <laughs> 
ويسجلون هنا جميع الشخصيات الوطنية أنه هذا شخص مشاغب وهو غير محب للسلام ولأنه يحرض الناس One such Palestinian, patriot or troublemaker, was the Greek Catholic Bishop of Acre, Gregorus Hajar. He had warned against the Jews wishing to take over Palestine. Bishop Hajar is known as the Bishop of the Arabs. In 1940, he was killed in a car crash on the way to Haifa. Local police reports suggested it was not an accident. Today, he is held in esteem by both Christian and Muslim Palestinians. بريطانيا كانت تمارس بذلك ضغط هائل على السكان من سياسة العقاب الجماعي، حرق البيادر وتجميع الرجال وإجبارهم بالسير على الجمر وعلى ألواح الصبر والتعذيب وخلط المواد الغذائية وبعضها خلط الزيت بالسكر وما إلى ذلك. والتجويع وهدم المنازل والحصار الشديد في أيام الحرب القائضة كل هذه الأمور مجتمعة أثرت على معنويات الشعب الفلسطيني وقدرته على الاستمرار بالثورة خاصة الكثير من كوادر الثورة تم القضاء عليها. In addition to the targeting of its leaders, the revolution was also infiltrated. صاروا اليهود يشتغلوا مع المخابرات البريطانية مرات مثلا كان واحد يهودي يجي عنده صاحب عربي بيجيب معلومات اليهودي بيتسل على الجيش البريطاني وبيروحوا ما بعد يسوي اعتكالات في عشان اليهود طبعا ما لهمش دولة وما لهمش جيش حقيقي يسوي اعتكالات في في بلد معين هذا صار صار كثير وكمان كان عشان علاقتهم كانت كويسة مع مع البريطانيين اليهود مثلا إذا كان بدهم يسووا واحد من الثوار يجندوه كعميل كعميل كانوا يتصلوا بالبريطانيين يقولوا هذا الشخص ممكن يشتغل معنا هو في السجن فلتوا عنه خلوه يطلع ويشتغل معنا وأسسوا نوادي المسلمة الوطنية وكان كانت تدعم من قبل الساهنة هم حكوا ضد الحركة الوطنية مثلا لما راحوا وفود الحركة الوطنية للندن هم كانوا يبعثوا بركيات ضد هدول الوفود هدول الوفود ما ما تمثلنا والى اخره يعني الصهيونيه كانت تاسس نوادي ل اسمها اسلاميه اسلاميه وطنيه مش بس اسلاميه اسلاميه وطنيه وتدعمها بالمال تدعمها بسرا يعني اه بسير وكانوا يقعدوا مع بعض اليهود هدول الجماعه من هدول النوادي وبكتبوا بركيات للمندوب السامي وللوزير الخارجي البريطاني The Palestinian revolt lasted from 1936 to 1939. In that period, an estimated 5,000 Palestinians were killed and 14,000 wounded. Some 100 British soldiers and 400 Jews also died during the revolt. أمر اللي يعمل الحرب يعني بين ال 18 وبين ال 40 أم في السجن أم مقتول أم مجروح أم مطرود من البلد ففعلا كل الجيل الذي قد يكون جيش لمقاومة الحركة اليهودية في الأربعينات كان مفقود اللي كان نشيد بالثورة أو انقتل أو هرب أو انعدم يعني ما كان في أي مؤسسات تقريبا يعني بالمجتمع الفلسطيني لا مؤسسات ولا ولا نشيطين ولا ولا إشي يعني كانت كانت كان كان المجتمع بش ب ب بوضع كتير كتير متدهور يعني. And the Palestinian society was leaderless in many many ways, both militarily and politically. And although there was a Palestinian leadership in exile. It had very uh, a loose connection to the events inside Palestine. So I think it is fair to say that from 1939 onwards, there isn't a real Palestinian leadership on the ground. And this is one of the reasons that contributed to what happened in 1948. The battle for Palestine was lost by the Palestinians not in 1948, but in the late 1930s, because Britain completely smashed 
to the ground the Arab revolt and the Arab irregular forces. In 1939, Britain held a conference at St. James's Palace in London to discuss the partition of Palestine. The Arab and Jewish delegations refused to sit at the same table. يعني عدنا لنتفاوض مع الحاكم الشريك مع العدو الحقيقي لما تبقى لك من حقوق. After five weeks of talks, the conference failed in delivering the goal of bringing peace to Palestine. Later that year, the world was again at war. Soon after the outbreak of World War II, Jews in Palestine were permitted to enlist in the British Army. Fighters from the Haganah paramilitary group were trained by the British. They would later form the core of the Israeli army. ولا يزال بعضهم كمان لا يزال بجوز بعضهم أحياء منهم اللي اشتغلوا في الجيش البريطاني كمان في هذه الفترة وهذا على فكرة أثر في 48 عشان كان في كتير ألاف من اليهود منظمين و... ومجندين بيعرفوا يستعملوا سلاح ومنهم زبات ومنهم بيعرفوا ب... بالمدافع يعني بال... و... كله بالسلكي وبكل ما كل الأشياء وكل ال... إنه جيش مهني لازم يعرف إشي ما كان موجود بال بالطرف الفلسطيني طبعا لا شك إن الخبرة التي استفادت الجندي اليهودي من خلال الحرب العالمية الثانية استفاد كثير خلال حرب فلسطين في الأربعينات رأينا في فلسطين جنود يهودي لهم خبرة واسعة في استعمال الإسلاحات وفي كل المجالات حتى في الطيران في الدبابات وفي السلاح البسيطة التي تحمل يحمل الجندي العادي فكان لهم كل الخبرة وبعدين في في العلوم العسكرية يوجد ضباط يهودية اللي وصلوا إلى هذه الدرجة تحت الجيش البريطاني as war engulfed the world. In Palestine, according to Israeli historian Ilan Pape, Jewish groups initiated an intriguing intelligence gathering operation. The first stage was the collection of material about every village in Palestine. This was called the Village Files uh, Project. Uh, they were quite amazing because they had information of every village uh, in Palestine. Uh, mainly uh, about the details of how good actually it would be to take it over. So there's a lot of information about the quality of the land, how rich the people were, to the extent that they even knew how many fruit are on each tree, th there is on each tree, uh, what were the political affiliation of people, how easy or how difficult it would be to occupy it. So, uh, so it was they started gathering in the 30s? Or in, in the late 30s, yeah. in the late 30s and early 1940s, yes. They were actually using, uh, exploiting uh, Arab hospitality, because if you come to a village in Palestine, it doesn't matter who you are, you're invited. And they used that hospitality in order to spy around. And uh, especially what they needed were two things. One was to know how, how to access the village later on in order to occupy it, and uh, to know what the village had in terms of assets and so on, that when they occupied that people would not, you know, run away with what the Zionists wanted for, for themselves. Zionists were keen to increase the number of Jews coming to Palestine. But following the St. James Conference in 1939, the British imposed limitations on Jewish immigration. This change in British policy was met with opposition. 
1940, a French-built ocean liner, Patria, was at Haifa Harbor carrying 1,800 Jewish refugees who had earlier arrived from Nazi-occupied Europe. The British were deporting them to Mauritius. To prevent this, the Haganah group planted a bomb on board to disable the ship. A large hole was blown into the side of the ship, and some 260 people on board died when the boat sank. Details of this operation were disclosed 17 years later by the Haganah member who had planted the bomb. The British were struggling to contain the situation in Palestine. Meanwhile, in New York in May 1942, an important meeting took place at the Biltmore Hotel. Some 600 prominent American delegates and Zionist leaders attended. The meeting was prompted by the realization that America, not Britain, would henceforth play a part in the fulfillment of Zionist designs. Attendees included David Ben-Gurion, the head of the Jewish agency, and Chaim Weissman, president of the Zionist organization. The Biltmore Declaration outlined support for what it called the establishment of a Jewish Commonwealth in all of Palestine. It condemned Britain's limits on Jewish immigration. Other Americans raised concerns about the Zionist program. In 1943, General Patrick Hurley, a former Secretary of War, submitted a report to President Roosevelt following a visit to Palestine and a meeting with Ben-Gurion in Jerusalem. In the report, Hurley was highly skeptical of the Zionist agenda. He summarized its expansionist aims. The Zionist organization in Palestine has indicated its commitment to an enlarged program for one, a sovereign Jewish state which would embrace Palestine and probably eventually Transjordan. Two, the eventual transfer of the Arab population from Palestine to Iraq. Three, Jewish leadership for the entire Middle East in the fields of economic development and control. Zionist supporters in America were undeterred. In 1944, the World Jewish Conference met in Atlantic City, in the state of New Jersey. The speeches left little doubt about their drive to see the establishment of a Jewish Commonwealth in Palestine. With Jewish Commonwealth inherits Israel. Others Israel means nothing more than justice to the Jew, freedom for the Jew, equality of the Jewish people with all the free peoples of Earth. That the real solution of the Jewish problem cannot be brought about unless the Jewish people will be given the right and will be held by the United Nations to establish Palestine once and for all as its own Jewish family. This conference appeals to the United Nations to ensure that the general scheme of post-war reconstruction shall include the establishment of Palestine as a free and democratic Jewish commonwealth. In 1945, following the end of World War II, US President Harry Truman appeared to encourage the Zionist agenda by recommending the 100,000 displaced Jews in Europe be allowed to emigrate to Palestine. Always hope that we'll finally arrive at the peace in the world which we anticipated when we uh, created the United Nations. That's, that's the only reason. 
Back in Palestine, Britain was maintaining its new policy of limiting Jewish immigration. As a result, the different Jewish paramilitaries decided to begin coordinating attacks against the British military. The main Jewish force, the Haganah, agreed to work with the Ergun and Stern Gang. The Jewish resistance movement was formed. David Ben-Gurion persuaded members of the Jewish community in America to fund the purchase of arms manufacturing machinery so that the Haganah could produce its own weapons. Meanwhile, Palestinian politician Musa al Alami went on a tour of the Arab world. In Arab capitals, he discovered complacency towards the situation in Palestine. The general view being that the Arabs vastly outnumbered the Jews and could control the Jewish minority. For their part, the British realized how volatile the situation had become in Palestine. They began to evacuate British families. Discussions went on between the Zionist movement and the British authorities. Documents reveal that Chaim Weizmann held secret conversations in March and July of 1946 with the British High Commissioner, Alan Cunningham. In these talks, they discussed the partition of Palestine and how the parts of a viable Israeli state should be linked up, giving it control of both the Negev Desert and the waters of Galilee. On the ground in Palestine, the British army continued to confiscate arms from both sides. In the first half of 1946, over 300 Palestinians were arrested for the possession of weapons. At this time, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Amin al-Husseini, was in France. He had spent the war years in Italy and Germany, hoping the Axis countries would win World War II and that their victory would herald independence for Palestine. يعني حاجة مين كان يخاف إنه إذا بتصير في هون مؤسسات ويكون في هون كيادة جديد يمكن يعني ما 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 يكون عنده تأثير زي ما كان وما يكون على منصب الكيادة. مفتي القدس الحقيقة الحاج جميل يعني نحن بنحسن النية فيه لكن كان في قناعتي أنا الشخصية دون مستوى القيادة لكن تنسيش البيئة العامة البلد الرجل كان مفتي فلسطين العام ورئيس المجلس الإسلامي ما شاء الله تعالى مش أنا اللي عينته اللي عينه الإنجليز كمان. في مايو 1946 المفتي went to Egypt to participate in a summit meeting of Arab leaders. The newly formed Arab League's first item of agenda was to coordinate a response to the situation in Palestine. A follow-up meeting of Arab foreign ministers was held in Blue Dan, Syria. Present as an observer was the director of British military intelligence in the Middle East, Brigadier Iltid Clayton. Meanwhile, back in Palestine, the British army was now the target of an increasing number of attacks from Jewish paramilitary groups. Against British restrictions, extremists wreck a train on the outskirts of Jerusalem. Armed crewmen inspect the hole where the explosion which caused the wreck occurred, and guards patrol the area. The continued unrest... Violence and death ride the ancient streets of Jerusalem, and here the climax, blasting of police headquarters. Three men lost their lives in this attack. A roving band shot up the station first, then launched high explosives. Soldiers combed the debris for other dead as turmoil seethes in the cradle of brotherly love. New High Commissioner Cunningham investigates. Tommies patrol the streets and quiet descends. Is it the calm before another storm? The King David Hotel in Jerusalem, site of the largest and most audacious attack on the British Mandate forces. The building was used by the British as their administrative and military headquarters. On July the 22nd, 1946, 
a huge explosion demolished the entire southwest side of the hotel. 91 people were killed. The attack was carried out by Ergen, the Jewish paramilitary group. The King David Hotel was not to be their last target. On March the 1st, 1947, Ergen blew up the British Officers Club at Goldsmith House in Jerusalem. Jewish terrorist gang to intimidate authority. 16 persons die and 13 others are injured as extremists blow up the Officers Club in an unremitting campaign of violence. Universal's cameraman, on the scene minutes after the explosion, records the stunned and shaken victims as they are carried from the wreckage. Few of the 50 officer inmates of the club escaped injury as extremists, under cover of rifle fire, hurled explosive-laden suitcases through the windows and doors of the building. Several of the injured died later of their wounds. The club is a shambles, a reprisal for the deportation of Jews from Haifa. In July 1947, Ergen kidnapped two British sergeants, Clifford Martin and Mervyn Pace. They were abducted as retaliation for the arrest and scheduled execution of three Ergen members. The British authorities carried out the executions of the three Jewish militants. The following day, the two British soldiers were found hanging in a field near Netanya. Follow the hanging of two British sergeants by extremists. Palestine becomes an armed camp. Inside the hanging of the two um, uh, British Army sergeants probably accelerated the uh, speedy exodus from Palestine of the British Monday. The graves of the British soldiers can still be found in a British military cemetery in Ramla, south of Tel Aviv. Following the so-called Sergeant's Affair, British forces in Palestine went on a heightened state of alert. The leader of Ergen was Menachem Begin. The group's symbol contained the map of a Jewish state that encompassed the whole of Palestine as well as Transjordan. 25 high-ranking officials of the Irgunzweil Leumi and Stern Gang British authorities arrested Begin after distributing his photo with the slogan, Wanted for Murder. Thirty years later, Begin became the Prime Minister of Israel. We signed by President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin, and it will be with In 1978, Begin was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize along with Egypt's President Anwar al Sadat. During the last eight years of the British mandate in Palestine, British documents recorded over 500 attacks by underground Jewish groups. These included parcel bombs sent to British officials. On January the 12th, 1947, another Jewish group, the Stern Gang, parked a truck loaded with explosives outside a British police station. From Haifa come pictures showing the result of the recent outrage that shattered the brief lull in terrorist activity. The incident was caused by a man, believed by some to be one of the Stern Gang this time, driving a stolen van full of explosives to quarters where it blew up. Two British and two Arab policemen were killed and others are reported missing. More than 60 police, soldiers and civilians were injured. Many of the casualties were caused by flying glass and a great deal of damage was done, not only at police headquarters but also in the neighbourhood. Windows were broken as far as a mile away. Former British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who had been a prominent and enthusiastic supporter of Zionism, condemned the attack.
With attacks on British troops escalating, the British felt increasingly beleaguered in Palestine. In February 1947, Britain announced the decision to end its mandate in Palestine. Its spokesman said his country would turn over the difficult situation to the United Nations. British public opinion will permit no more expenditure of life and treasure. It will acquiesce no longer in the use of British forces and the squandering of British lives to impose a policy in Palestine which one or other of the parties is determined to resist. It is brought down on our heads the execration of the Jews and the bitter resentment of the Arabs. It has made us the butt of malicious criticism throughout the world. We have played our part. Britain was now washing its hands of Palestine, setting in motion events that would lead towards the momentous year of 1948.